Welcome to my talk about securing confidential VMs with Coconut SVSM. My name is Jörg Rödel, I work for SUSE, um, and I'm the maintainer of the Coconut SVSM project. So Coconut SVSM was mentioned in the previous talk already. Um, I want to go into a few more details uh, in my presentation. But first of all, what is my agenda? So um, I, I will start with an introduction um, of the project. Um, then I go dive a little bit into the Coco, v Coco VM thread model. That also was part of the previous talk already. Um, I will take it, I will add some different perspective to that. Um, then I show you how, how the uh, threads are usually uh, mitigated using a hardware extension. And then I get to uh, the Coconut SVSM and explain how the Coconut SVSM helps to mitigate things that can be, cannot be mitigated in hardware or not easily mitigated in hardware. Um, and I will finalize the talk with the project status, so where we currently are with Coconut SVSM and what are our future plans. So let's dive right in. What is Coconut SVSM? That's a question I get from time to time, and this is my default answer. So the Coconut uh, Secure VM Service Module is a platform to provide secure hypervisor services to confidential virtual machines. So that's a very generic sentence. So what does it mean? Um, that's um, the topic of my talk. But first of all, some history of the project. Um, so I started with it in uh, early 2022, with starting some code uh, to prototype a few things. Um, over time, it, it, it grew and came to the point where it could um, execute, a, or where it can run a Linux guest OS in a, in a confidential VM in early 2023, which was the point where I decided to publish the project to make it open source. Um, this happened at, at the OC3 conference, the Open Confidential Compute conference last year. Um, and, and this was, I think, quite successful since then we gained a really good developer community. So up to date, we have 23 contributors. Um, we made good progress. Then the project was published. Um, we, got a, we got file system support in the SVSM. We have support for tasks, so we can run different tasks and switch between them. We gained a TPM emulation recently, and the project also gained a lot of um, continuous integration features and fuzzers to um, test parts of the code and make it, uh, and, and check whether it's uh, secure and uh, bug-free and, 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 and catch bugs early in development. Um, another important point I want to highlight here is that uh, the Coconut SVSM project applied to, to become the project of the Confidential Computing Consortium. This happened in November last year, um, where I presented uh, the project to the Technical Advisory Council, and in December, um, the Technical Advisory Council accepted the project. And since then, the onboarding is in progress, which yeah, takes some time because some, some legal stuff is uh, involved. Um, but I'm happy to announce that onboarding is mostly finished, um, so the project will soon be part of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is, I think, really great. So um, let's dive in. Um, let me present you a little different perspective or an another perspective to the confidential computing VM thread model. So um, if you look at the uh, normal virtual machine setup, you have a virtual machine which runs your kernel and your applications, and you have the hypervisor which basically drives all of your virtual, all of your virtual machine and does certain things to actually make your virtual machine running. The most important things that the hypervisor does, or the most important tasks, tasks of the hypervisor are memory management, so managing the memory the virtual machine can use, handling intercepts of the virtual machine, um, inject interrupts, and emulate devices. Um, so now what happens if you don't trust the hypervisor anymore because uh, you don't own the hypervisor and you still want your data to be, to be secure? Um, this is not really possible when the hypervisor does all of these uh, tasks. And now let's look into, into how mitigate these possible attack vectors uh, from the hypervisor to the virtual machine. Um, usually there are two, um, two uh, options to, to mitigate um, the attacks from the hypervisor. Um, there is mitigation with hardware extensions, which is what confidential computing is all about. Um, or if, if that is not possible because the extension does not provide so, or does not include all, all features to mitigate um, all attack vectors, then there's still the option to move hypervisor tasks into the guest context. Uh, 
Most mitigations available today use actually a mix of above options. So even the hardware mitigations need, need guest support code or su support in the guest kernel or in the, yeah, to um, make use of that. So how does threat mitigation and hardware works? Um, so there are hardware extensions. Those were also mentioned in the previous talk already. Um, every hardware vendor comes up with, with a different one. So we have on AMD, SCV, SNP, on Intel, we have TDX. ARM is uh, coming up with uh, the confidential computing architecture, ARM CCA. And uh, RISC-V is also uh, specifying an, an extension, the confidential virtualization extension. Um, these extensions have a mostly identical feature set. So feature-wise, they are not, different, not very different. The implementations actually differ. Um, um, and one important thing to, to notice here is that the non x 6 architecture extensions are closer to Intel TDX than AMD SCV SNP in the overall architecture and in how they are, have to be used from the hypervisor. So um, in my presentation, I will focus mostly on the x86 architecture extensions. Um, I, will note, I will note differences between uh, AMD and Intel when it is important, but, the con but all concepts I'm talking about here are also applicable to non-x86 non -X86 architectures. Um, so let's look how the hardware helps us to secure um, Hypervisor functionality, so first is memory management. Without confidential computing, the hypervisor can read all guest memory. Um, now there, is, there are hardware extensions and every confidential computing um, extension supports that. Um, the first protection is basically encrypting guest memory, so, so that only when the virtual machine is running, the memory can be seen unencrypted. Um, and the hypervisor can only see the encrypted state or no, state or, or no memory at all. Um, but this is only, only part of the protection that, that is needed. There is also a mitigation against um, attacks against the, the encrypted memory, which, which are mostly uh, memory remapping and replay attacks. Um, so even with encrypted memory, the hypervisor could replay old state on, on, uh, on encrypted memory, or it can map uh, data from one guest physical address to, a, to another. Um, this is also uh, mitigated by hardware, not in that, it's, it, not in that it is prevented, um, but it is, such behavior is made, de is made detectable in the virtual machine, so the virtual machine can detect when the hypervisor is um, trying to attack the virtual machine using remapping or, or replay attacks. And with that, memory management um, is, can be considered secure, so the data is stored in a, in a, in a secure way. Um, how is intercept handling secured? Um, so for intercept handling, the hypervisor needs usually access to the guest register state, which is problematic because the register state can A, contain secrets, like AES keys in, uh, in floating point registers, and the register state can also be used if it can be modified to um, attack the instruction flow by changing uh, stack pointers or instruction pointers of the guest. So. Um, to mitigate, intercept, to mitigate the attack vectors from intercept handling, the hypervisor can, cannot do the intercept handling itself anymore. Um, so this, is, this is also mitigated by, by, by hardware extensions or uh, in confidential computing by basically um, by basically uh, not trapping intercepts to the, to the host hypervisor, but trapping them to an exception in the guest kernel, and the guest kernel can do intercept handling itself. Um, on AMD, this is a VC exception. On Intel, this is, this is a VE exception. Um, so intercepts are handled in the trusted guest context this way. The trusted guest context has access to all registers. Um, and there's usually also a para-virtual interface to the hypervisor to actually get data to, which is needed to fulfill the request. For example, MSR reads and writes. Um, the guest cannot emulate it fully on its own for that. To get host emula emulated MSR values, the uh, um, guest has still to ask the host but this happens via a para-virtualized protocol. And with that, intercept handling is basically removed from the hypervisor and happening in the guest kernel now, and this way is also made secure. The next thing is interrupt injection. Um, this is where it's a difference between Intel and uh, AMD. I think this was also briefly mentioned in the, in the, in the talk before. Um, so on, on Intel TDX, um, 
the architecture provides a virtualized interrupt controller, a hardware virtualized interrupt controller for the guest, which actually prevents um, some kinds of, of, of IRQ attacks. Um, it, it basically prevents that the, that the interrupt can be injected at any time, even when the guest is not expecting it. Um, it does not allow to, to, to limit the number of vectors that can be injected, but the guest kernel does not need to be prepared to receive any interrupt at any given time, even when interrupts are disabled. So, um, so this is uh, mitigated via a hardware feature on Intel TDX. On AMD, it's a bit different because there is no hardware virtualized interrupt controller for confidential VMs. Um, so the feature here is restricted injection, basically limit the injection of events to an HV vector to one, to one vector, to one exception vector. The guest kernel has to be prepared to receive this HV vector at any given time, at every instruction boundary. But this is something that can be taken care of in, in, in software. The issue here is that it's not only done with, with injection, but there's also the point of, inter of interrupt delivery. And the interrupt delivery has to be happen inside guest kernel now. So all the interrupt delivery logic that's usually lived in the hypervisor is now moved to the guest, is now moved to the guest context. So, so the guest kernel has to, has to decide itself when it is ready to deliver an, an interrupt. This has some challenges and is a complex thing to do. So, um, but with this way, we can make interrupt injection um, secure on AMD. The last uh, point here is device simulations, and this was um, broadly covered in the last talk. Um, this is not so easy to mitigate because um, there, are, there, are, there are only limited <coughs> hardware extensions to allow device or to, to have device simulations in the guest on, in the guest side. So this is not so easy to uh, mitigate. Um, so what, what um, options do we have? We can harden Linux device drivers. Um, this was what Elena and uh, Carlos were talking about. Uh, this is an important uh, effort. Um, what, what alternatives do we have? We can emulate devices in VE VC handlers. That is possible because VE and VC handlers get all MMIO um, accesses or MMIO traps into these handlers, so these can be used to actually emulate devices. Um, problem is, the still we still need a simpler interface to the hypervisor to actually get the data from, for, from the devices, so for a disk or network device, for example. So this is a rather questionable exercise. Um, and the most problematic thing are actually devices that carry security-sensitive state, um, because those devices cannot be, cannot be uh, emulated by the hypervisor when the hypervisor is, is untrusted. Even when the, 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 uh, the Linux device driver is, is, is hardened and, and secure against any attacks from the device, still the state of the device lives in the host which is untrusted. So this is not, this cannot be secure in a confidential computing environment. Um, and, and, and also, um, the, the security capabilities of those devices um, usually live on the fact that the guest OS can also cannot access the device state. So we need a way to protect device of security sensitive, um, state of security sensitive devices from the guest OS and from the hypervisor. Um, ex example devices are TPM device, but also um, an EFI variable store, for example. Um, so, and this is where Coconut SVSM comes into the picture. So, so Coconut SVSM is an additional software component that runs within um, the, the confidential virtual machine and which aims to provide these services like emulation of secure devices to the guest operating system. Um, Coconut SVSM relies on a, on, on, on a hardware feature of confidential virtualization extensions, um, which, is, uh, um, which is memory isolation within the virtual machine. Um, so newer hardware generations support um, memory isolation within confidential virtual machines on AMD, SCB, SNP, this are VM privilege levels. On Intel TDX, it's partitioning. Others will probably follow. Um, and what, what, all of these, what all of these extensions have in common is that they provide, uh, that they establish a privilege model orthogonal to the CPU privilege levels inside the virtual machine. 
So, you ha so on, on AMD SCB SMP, for example, you have four BMPLs, and in each BMPL you, ca you have all four CPU privilege levels from ring zero to ring up to ring three and can execute code there on any, on any CPU privilege level. Um, on, on, on every of these architectures, there is a, a, a most privileged level, which is VMPL0 on AMD and L1 on TDX, um, which has more privileges than the others. And the key feature of, this, uh, of, this fe of these features is that the highest privileged level can basically define which parts of the guest memory the lower levels can actually access. And, and, and this can be used uh, by software like Coconut SVSM that runs in the, in the highest privilege level to actually define memory which is not accessible to the operating system and which can be used to store state of security sensitive um, devices. Um, and this brings us to Coconut SVSM, which is a software that um, is designed to run on the highest privilege level and uh, help OSs running on lower privilege levels in confidential VMs. Um, so a bit of a dive into the project. Um, Coconut SVSM is an OS level software designed to run on, uh, in confidential virtual machines, currently only on AMD, but I hope this uh, will change soon. It is written in a stable REST. Um, it implements common kernel concepts. It has memory management. It has a file system, only an in-memory file system, but uh, it has a file system. It has a task concept. It uses cooperative scheduling. Um, which is mostly due to the fact that there is up to date no interrupt source um, that could do uh, that would allow um, preemptive scheduling. The code base uh, puts a strong focus on, on isolation. This is not completely ready yet, but um, we, are, we are getting there. And uh, the most important uh, feature in my mind is that Coconut SVSM wants to run the services it provides to the guest operating system in user mode. So have further isolation there and isolate the services that run um, with regard to each other. Um, the project is on GitHub. Um, under the URL, the, there is a, a, a whole project around it, which does not only contain the SVSM re repository, but also support code for Linux kernel, QMU, and EDK2. Um, these, except for EDK2, Two, no, not even EDK2, but all of these projects do not yet have upstream support for running an SVSM, though, so we still maintain this, these changes in um, support repositories in our um, Coconut SVSM GitHub project. Um, Coconut wants to support multiple hypervisors, so not only, not only um, KVM. It is currently mainly developed on the KVM hypervisor with a prototype support code. Um, Hyper-V support is currently emerging and possibly other, other um, vendors are working on support for using SVSM on their hypervisor too. Um, so that's a defined goal of the project to support multiple hypervisors. Um, and one way we, we do that is by using a, a standardized boot protocol using the independent guest virtual machine or HGVM file format. I'm not sure if you have heard of that already. That is a file format defined by Microsoft which basically allows to describe the initial memory layout of a confidential virtual machine. Which means that when you have such a file and a, and a guest platform configuration, you can calculate the expected launch measurement from, from only that file and compare that to the actual launch measurement of your VM later and see if it's identical. And if it's identical, you know that the IGVM file was loaded correctly by the hypervisor, by, by your untrusted hypervisor. Um, but not, but not only that, um, the IGVM file format on, also standardizes um, parts of the hypervisor interface, um, which is great. For example, getting the memory map uh, with, which the SVSM needs or, or some ACPI tables, um, which is also a good feature of IGVM because otherwise we would have to have interfaces to, to, each, to each hypervisor we want to support um, for getting this information. Um, <coughs> The, the, the QMU, which we, which we host on the Coconut SVSM project, already has support for IGVM, and we use it as our standard boot protocol uh, during development right now. So the code is there. Um, we are doing work to, uh, to push it upstream, but um, yeah, we are, we are getting there. Um, hardware support, what hardware do we support? Um, as I said, we currently develop on AMD SCP SNP. We are at on the VM privilege levels features. 
there is support for TDX emerging 1.5 because 1.5 is the version that um, adds TDX partitioning support. There's a prototype branch for that available on GitHub. Um, and there's even and even support for non-x86 architectures is currently the planning phase. Um, this requires some bigger reworks of some code parts because we need the right abstractions in place to actually add code like page table management and everything for other architectures. Also, and also boot up code and CPU setup code and stuff. Um, user mode, I mentioned that already, it's, it's one of the key features the SC Coconut SVSM project wants to support. Um, so services will, will run as tasks in user mode because tasks have less privileges, of course. So if there's a bug in one service, you, can, you do not usually get to um, get secrets from, from, from other services. Um, so there's isolation there. Um, and we also plan to have a security layer um, which limits what services can do and how they can interact with the SVSM kernel. Um, you can think of it in the terms of an SE Linux thing, just, but just simpler and for the SVSM and its, um, hyper uh, and its Cisco interface that is emerging. Um, so here's a high level design um, as a summary of, uh, for the Coconut SVSM. Um, so the, the, the Coconut SVSM runs alongside the, the guest OS within the trusted execution environment. Um, it makes a distinction between kernel mode and user mode. The, the, the kernel mode runs the Coconut kernel and the user mode runs the services as separate tasks. And the guest OS runs in the lower VM privilege level or in another TDX partition and interacts with the SVSM either directly or indirectly. And the guest OS, of course, has a separate kernel user mode um, differentiation. Um, so putting this all together, um, with this design, we can actually have um, add device emulations to the guest context. To, we can move them out of the hypervisor into the guest context. Um, and starting with uh, devices that cannot live in the hypervisor like TPM and, and an EFI variable store. Um, the, co the Coconut SVSM allows to emulate them actually inside the guest context. Other device emulations still live in, um, in the hypervisor and are untrusted, but this is where device driver hardening comes into the picture again. So what is the status of the project and what um, our, what are our plans for um, the future? Um, as I said, it runs on AMD SCV SNP systems. We have essential kernel functionality implemented. We can handle SVSM core protocol requests on, on, on the AMD platform. Um, we recently merged a TPM emulation with, with no persistence yet, but uh, still it's a, it's a start. Um, it still runs in kernel mode because user mode is not fully ready yet. It's emerging. We are getting there. We have support for kernel tasks, and as I said, user mode support is emerging. Um, speaking of user mode, we, where are we? Um, as I said, this is one of the key features, so I want to highlight it here. Um, so there is currently a PR pending, which um, adds code to load elf binaries and execute them in, in ring three. So this is um, there is code for that now. This, only two testing this calls, which are not, not very useful, but uh, it's a start. Um, I started the work on a Rust user space library, which contains of a syscall wrapper, create um, a, a heap allocator for user space, um, a custom linker script for binaries um, that, are, that are linked and, and targeted to run in, in, in user mode. Um, so that's where we are. What are the next steps? The next steps are to uh, first build an init task that launches the other services or that reads some configuration and then launches other services. Um, that, of course, requires this calls, uh, uh, getting the, the user mode support library to a certain point. Um, and when that is up and running, um, the plan is to move the request loop into a separate user mode task and then move the TPM code into another user mode task to have all of them isolated against each other. So this is uh, the roadmap, which uh, I hope to achieve within the next couple of months. Um, what else are we planning to do? Um, another important thing is persistence. Um, this is also being worked on right now in the community because yes, support for, persist for persistence state is uh, actually needed to 
because it makes sense to persist actual TPM state. Um, for example, you can use the TPM to store the key of your of your disk image, so um, as, and you can't regenerate the, the key every time you boot up your VM. So, so it makes sense to persist the TPM state, and when you when your uh, VM boots up and, your, and all your measurements are correct, you get the disk key from the TPM. So this is one use case um, for what persistence is needed, but also for EFI variables. It, of course, um, brings a whole lot of new problems because with persistence, we need um, an encryption and an integrity protection layer for our persistent data. And when we have encryption, we also need an, we also need an encryption key somehow in the VM, which must not be visible to the hypervisor, so we need to get it via some kind of key broker service in the early boot phase of the SVSM, which in turn re requires early attestation. Um, yeah, so it's, it's complicated. Um, there's currently a design for that in, in the works. Um, so we are currently working on a, or the community is currently working on a design document of how to um, implement that. And the plan is to have this document peer reviewed by um, security experts. Um, and then when we agree on a, on a good solution, then we will make progress on that and get to actual persistence within the SVSM. Um, and the long-term vision for the S for the coconut SVSM to grow into a paravisor. Um, you might have heard this term already. What is a paravisor? Um, in, a, in a nutshell, a paravisor is a trusted in-guest virtual machine manager, um, which means it does not only emulate devices with security-sensitive state, it also handles intercepts from the guest operating system. It, it can emulate certain devices um, for the guest OS, and it uh, can also take care of secure IRQ injection. For example, it can, it can filter it can filter the IRQs that the, that the host can inject to your operating system, which would mitigate all attacks where the hypervisor injects um, malicious vectors like and AD or an AMD exception vectors like the VC exception, which has been proven to be usable for attacks. So this can all be done in a paravisor, and, and when the coconut SVM, SVSM is a paravisor, this can all be mitigated uh, there. Um, this brings us to the distinction between enlightened and non-enlightened OSs. Um, I briefly mentioned that on a, on a, on a, on a previous slide. Um, so Linux is, is, a, is an enlightened OS when it comes to confidential computing. So it has awareness of confidential computing features. Uh, it can handle private and shared memory. It has VC and VE handling at the kernel level. And it is being hardened against malicious hypervisor behavior. But this is not true. This is not true for all OSs out there, right? There are OSs that have no real notion of private and shared memory and, no real no and, and do not implement ABC or VE handlers themselves. Um, so without an SVSM or without a paravisor, these OSs will not be able to run inside a confidential virtual machine. Um, the good thing is we can outsource all of this awareness to the paravisor, to the, to the in-guest VMM. Um, implement this functionality inside the SVSM and get the ability to run um, unenlightened operating systems or operating systems which are mostly unaware of running in a confidential VM. Um, yeah. the, primary, the primary example here is uh, Microsoft Windows, which has some enlightenment, but not much. So um, running Microsoft Windows in a, in a confidential VM requires actually, basically requires a paravisor. So. Um, and in uh, paravisor mode, the coconut SVSM would basically handle all of this. Um, it would be responsible for the interrupt injection. It would still, it would still emulate the TPM device um, and also a, a variable store and things. But it would also handle guest intercepts, um, which, in, which uh, in turn enables it to emulate devices because intercepts usually happen also on memory mapped I.O. accesses which is the key to, to, to emulate devices in the, in the SVSM via an MMIO interface. Um, so we, we have a better way of moving device emulations uh, into, the, into the paravisor and the SVSM, reducing the need to, to actually harden um, device drivers in the Linux kernel. Um, but um, the need is not fully removed because, um, especially for device emulation, there is a, there is a there's likely a, a, a performance overhead 
um, involved because now device accesses go to go from the operating system kernel to the coconut SVSM and then down to the paravisor, which needs to get the data for, of a disk, for example, and then back via the SVSM to the kernel. So this path gets getting longer and so emulating devices in the SVSM is less performant but more secure. So but, we, but because of these performance properties, it still makes sense to, have, to allow device emulations in uh, the host hypervisor. But for this, we have the um, device driver hardening uh, mitigation. So this is not, uh, this is not a big um, issue. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you for uh, listening and um, yeah, happy to answer all your questions now. How do you envision the, the TPM attestations, uh, including the TEE attestation info on unenlightened guests? I'm not the best cryptographic expert to, to make a statement on that. Um, it, I think there are ways to, to, to do that via, um, via the ephemeral key of the, of the basically derive the ephemeral key from the attestation. If we do that, then I think it's possible, not 100% sure, but yeah, I think there are, there are ways to, to do that. Going back to your uh, earlier comments about uh, device emulation. Um, you, uh, if I understood your uh, slide correctly, there was no need for device driver hardening. Did I, did I understand that correctly? Yes, if, if the device emulation is running in inside guest context, inside the SVSM, then your device emulation is actually part of the initial attestation and you know what is running and it's basically trusted code running there and you basically can trust the device emulation. So the uh, device will still require a device driver, is that correct? You mean on the, on the, on the guest kernel side or on the SVSM side? On the uh, SVM. Yeah, so there still needs to be an interface to the hypervisor. For okay. example, if you emulate a disk device, you don't store the, the disk data in the SVSM, so this is still in the hypervisor. Um, but this interface can be a lot simpler than, than a real device interface. And the hardening has to actually happen inside the SVSM and not in, inside of the guest OS. Okay. And since you mentioned the kernel side, I'll ask about, is a device driver still required on the kernel side as well? On the OS kernel side, yes. Okay. So All right. the SVSM can, can, for example, emulate a NVMe device, and that would still require an NVMe driver inside the guest operating system inside the Linux kernel, for example. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hi, good presentation. So my first question is uh, a bit kind of high level. Uh, where do you see this? Uh, from packaging and deployment perspective uh, in the whole scheme of things deployed. Like, this essentially use, usable in the scenarios where, you know, you're doing cloud computing and confidential computing, right? And uh, cloud providers provide their own UFI image. Do you see that being bundled as part of the image that cloud providers provide? Or do you see that uh, as part of the operating system image that are up in the cloud providers repositories? Um, so, in a perfect world, the cloud service providers would basically allow um, uh, bringing your own firmware model, where you can basically deploy your, your virtual machine guest Im disk image together with an IGVM file. Mm -hmm. 
and the, the cloud service provider would load your IGVM file, and you can later see on, on, the, on the launch measurement if, it, if your file was loaded and if, if everything is correct. Um, I'm not sure if, every, if, if, if that's on, uh, if that's planned by the CSPs. Um, the, the alternative is, of course, to have um, reproducible builds of the coconut SVSM image. That's also something you're targeting for. Um, so then in this scenario, the cloud service provider would basically show you the, the build recipe it used to build its own image. And you can use that to also build an image and compare it, take the launch measurement from that and compare it to the launch measurement the cloud service provider or the, you get in your virtual machine at the, at the CSP. So um, that's another scenario. The IGVM file actually consists not only the SVSM, but also the firmware. So it also consists um, the, it contains the, the guest firmware, so the, the UEFI firmware usually. It's not limited to that. It can also be, it, it is very flexible format. You can also have scenarios where you, where you load a Linux kernel directly, for example, but um, that can all be part of the initial memory image. It, it, is, it is measured. Um, so the question is how, how, how this IGVM file is deployed and where it comes from. It currently looks like it comes from the hypervisor, uh, from the CSP, and that would require yeah, re reproducible builds to be yeah, yeah, secure. Yeah, that, that's where I was going <laughs> next with me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second question that I have is about, uh, about the TCB reduction within SVSM. I mean, I have been following this project for almost, I think, two and a half years. I haven't looked into the code, but slowly I have seen that functionalities are getting added on and the size is increasing, which usually is like uh, uh, the, the cry for security that, you know, the moment you start adding features, there are things which you'll keep resolving as bugs, which means that you want, you want, be, you, you, you want it to be able to uh, do some, some sort of TCB boundaries so that uh, the initial code, which is equivalent to something like on an SOC, a boot room kind of thing, which is going to provide you the attestation and hand you the encryption key for storage and all, uh, is very uh, less amenable to bugs and updates. So is there kind of TCB separation as well within SVSM? Um. Not besides the the, the privilege level isolation, so I that's, that's okay. the isolation you get. Um, okay. So there's currently also no plan to make the SVSM itself updatable within the guest OS. People might come up with something, but that's not something we currently have looked into. But okay. um, Thank you. Yeah. if there are bugs in the SVSM, you basically the best <coughs> option right now is to compile the or to get a new version and boot up your VM. Right, yeah. but yeah, my question was more about like let's say the initial part of the boot up of SVSM, there are no bugs, but TPM handling modules might have some bugs. So because yeah. of that, you have to update the entire thing now. So. Yeah, that's, that's how it's currently um, planned to do, but yeah. Thank you. So all, all, all services that, that the SVSM runs are, are also part of the initial measurement because the file system image that is deployed to the, to the SVSM memory is also part of the initial measurement. Yeah. Which makes it difficult to deploy additional services at runtime because you, w you won't have any, any measurement or attestation for that then, right? So yeah. you would have built software attestation on top of that to make that working. And the same is true for, for updating 40 modules in that, that, that are running inside your SPSM, so. Yeah, um, we can talk more about this offline. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for the talk, really interesting project. Um, my quick question is about uh, using Rust for this type of low level system development. It, in my experience, it requires uh, very often to use unsafe Rust extensions uh, when you have to craft um, inline assembly, for example. Um, have you put any thought into how to um, isolate unsafe Rust code segments in the project, uh, perhaps deprivilege those? Um, so that uh, no, we haven't looked at, at this yet. Um, I've seen that there's a, a Rust kernel project by Intel which, which implements this, and I plan to look into that and see what we can use of that for the SVSM tool. You might also want to look at the work that the NARCS project did um, in exactly this. We had a syscall handler with a bunch of unsafe um, stuff, which we were very careful about how we uh, 
how we manage that. So, and that's also a, a CCC project, so you can look at that. It's also all in Rust. So, yeah, um, yeah I suggest you have a look at that too. Thanks. I was uh, also going to ask, um, do you have any goals in terms of performance overhead? Because clearly that's one of the things you worry about. Um, I wouldn't call it goals. Um, currently, we, we put more, more emphasis on, um, on security than on performance. Um, the, the, that comes from the fact that in, in, in its initial mode, where we don't run as a full paravisor, um, the interaction with the SVSM is actually limited and not happening, happening very often, so performance is likely not a big issue. And we're getting into, into or at the point where we actually execute as a, as a paravisor, it becomes more of a problem. And then the plan is to look at the actual numbers and see where we can improve. So this is an iterative approach. We and there's, a, there's also load time um, overhead as well, which is worth right, yeah. thinking about. Thank you. Yeah, load time overhead is, a, is, a, is another thing. So initial measure, things that are uh, measured on launch can be slow. So there is also some effort to actually put the SVSM in non-measured memory and ha just have a small measured stub, which then compares or which then measures the SVSM in, in, in software, basically, and, and extends the initial measurement just to get a better launch performance. Any other uh, questions? So uh, you mentioned a lot about persistence. I guess I was wondering, it sounds like if someone wants to use SVSM for uh, persisting the initial VTPM seeds or the EFI variables, they kind of need to do this handshake with an escrow service. And I guess I'm wondering for sort of scaling out a cloud service deployment, do you have any thoughts on how that might look? Is this for those customers that really care about standing up this kind of service? Do you have thoughts on like who might own that as well as like the initial, the initialization of that state? Yeah, so this is a, this is a big topic actually. Um, it's not only, so it involves launch attestation. So we use, the plan is to use the initial attestation to prove to some key broker service that this VM is, is set up correctly. And then the key broker service will give us a key for our storage. The unsolved problem so far is how the VM does actually prove its identity. So you can have different, different disk images and you won't hand out all keys to all VMs, right? You won't be sure that it's the correct VM and it's correctly set up before you give it the key, right? And that's currently not a solved problem. So we discussed that in one of our meetings with no clear conclusion so far. Um, but this is part of the, of the, this will be part of the document that you're currently working on about how this, all of this initial attestation and key delivery is going to work all together with the early attestation. So. This is not a finalized design yet. But that, that's also the point why we want to have it in a, why we, want to ha why we want to have it written up before we actually implement it because we want, we want it to be possible to do peer review on the document and, 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 and on the approach we are, we are taking. So that security researchers can look into the document and see, oh, that's how you're doing and there are this and this problems. And then we can iterate and improve things and yeah. Okay. And then can you talk a little bit about the attestation model for a non-persistent TPM? Is it just using ephemeral seeds that are generated and attested to? Like, how does that work? Um, so this is how it works right now. Um, it, it basically generates an ephemeral key on, on launch. And it's the, the hash of the public key to the attestation report. So on SNP systems, you can put like 512 bits of data in, in, in the attestation report. And this is where the, where the, where the hash is put for, for, the, for the public key of the, of the um, TPM. And that is how trust is um, established to the TPM, to, uh, to a remote party actually, so yeah. Got it, thank you. I, th 
think time is almost up. Any last question? No? Then thanks for your questions, thanks for listening, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.